My little girl Audrey is the very definition of a Disney princess. She dresses up like Cinderella every chance she can get and dreams one day of becoming a Jedi. She's our only child, so... Of course she's a little spoiled. Her grandpa especially likes to dole on her with toys and plush animals from the company, so her room is filled with them. So I guess I should have been too surprised when I found out my dad had subscribed us to that new streaming service from the House of Mouse. I was a little excited. Thinking about how we could stream Moana in one room with her and then get the chance to watch the Mandalorian in bed. One look at the confirmation email told me that somehow he'd gotten us the wrong thing. Disney Minus. Sounds like the rejects, my wife joked. I didn't have the heart to tell my dad, so I figured if we got to quietly cancel after a few days and just sign us up for the correct service. Much to my surprise, though, that very same night I walked into the living room to find Aubrey glued to the tube watching some sort of Mickey Mouse off-brand. Now, the colors were off. Mickey was dancing like he had ants in his pants. And I was reminded of that old Steamboat Willie, but much, much cheaper. Didn't even seem to be in English. Either way, she was giggling and dancing all the same, so I didn't see the harm. Can I watch Pixar tomorrow? She asked as I tucked her into bed with her Jessie stuffed doll. Okay, I'll talk to Mom, I promised. As I settled for the night myself, I decided to do a web search on the curious streaming service. It came up short. As far as standard Google was concerned, Disney Minus didn't exist. Everything was pulling up the more traditional and extremely popular Disney Plus. Not nothing of it, and I went to bed only to be awoken a few hours later. To music blasting from the den. I stumbled through the door to see our little girl plastered to our big screen television at two in the morning. Tunes from a frozen wannabe threatening to make our ears bleed. Aubrey, what in the world are you doing? I asked as I reached for the remote. She didn't seem to notice. Her attention focused entirely on the show. The moment I turned it off, she reacted like a spoiled brat screaming and throwing herself on the floor. I hadn't seen her act like that in years. Aubrey, it's a school night. This is ridiculous, I chided her. The noise got so bad that my wife came in to help. Spoiler alert, yeah. She got a little bit of a snore. What's going on in here? She asked as she saw her kick and shriek. She was even trying to scratch me as I tried to pick her up off the floor. She was constantly repeating the same thing over and over like a mantra. I'm like, I have to finish the show. I have to finish. Aubrey, that's enough. She bellowed. And she stood over her and added, if you don't stop this behavior right now, we'll take away the TV for a whole week. For a moment, I thought maybe the words registered to her. But instead, she reacted more and more like a feral animal, ripping at her skin and trying to make me bleed. Until she managed to get free and snatch the remote up. I'd never seen her like that before. I've had enough! You're going to bed, young lady! My wife boomed. She was going to spank her, something we only do as a last resort. The second the show came back on, Aubrey immediately calmed down. She was... She was hooked on this off-brand Disney, and it was alarming how adamant she was at watching it. I crossed my arms, and I rubbed the bruise on my left wrist. Did she really grab me that hard? Didn't even know she had the strength, I thought. My wife returned a moment later and stood in front of the television. I thought maybe, maybe she had a chance to calm down and rethink the strategy on how to get her to cooperate, but from the look on her face, I could see that she was tired and frustrated. Aubrey, I'm giving you one last chance to turn off and go to bed, she warned as she snapped her fingers to get her attention. It didn't work. Aubrey was still staring at the screen even though my wife was in the way. She rolled her eyes. All right, have it your way, she said with a sigh, reaching down to smack her on her lower leg. I knew that she wasn't doing it in anger, just something to get her to obey. Aubrey stopped her mid-swing, grabbed her arm, and was holding her back. What in the... That was all my wife got to say. And then our little girl, barely eight and a half, tossed her across the room like she was some kind of Avenger. I saw her eyes go almost completely black when she did it, and I admit for a second, I thought she, she'd come after me next. When my wife hit the wall, a few photos dropped and the TV shook for a second. The images of the Elsa and Anna lookalikes glitched, and, and for a moment, I swear I saw something else. The closest thing I could describe it to is like a photo that hadn't been finished developing. Their eyes black and red and their skin was faded and their teeth were crooked. 
The ground looked covered with blood instead of the familiar fluffy snow. I went over to my wife to check if there was any injuries. What was that? I muttered as she looked across the room to where Aubrey was sitting. Aubrey had this weird smile on her face. She giggled. She was still watching the show. She was still dancing like nothing happened. But now I was convinced that this was beyond just a simple temper tantrum. Try unplugging the TV, I whispered to her nervously. The music on the screen seemed to be getting louder. The fake Disney characters weren't singing anymore. Now this, this sounded more like chanting. I, I couldn't even tell you what they said. It just, it just felt kind of evil. I had to use every resource available to stop it. My wife got up and slowly started to intro weight behind the flat screen TV so she could snag the surgeon. It didn't seem like our daughter was paying any attention to her. Instead, she was mimicking the words on screen, despite the fact that they were clearly being voiced in some ancient tongue. Then she started to dance, and it didn't look normal. This bordered on ritualistic. She was weaving her body on the carpet the way like a voodoo doll might. Like she had no control over her limbs. I was so frightened by it. So frightened I didn't move. Getting down on her hands and knees, my wife precariously slid her fingers towards the plug and successfully pulled it out from the wall. And then... Then the impossible happened. The stream kept playing. It went dark for less than a second and then it returned. Computerized cartoons didn't even look human. Now all, all doubt of this being from Satan himself had faded from my mind. The one that looked like Elsa now had six limbs that transformed into these, these long, spindly-looking mantis claws, each of them digging into the body of one of the Arendelle soldiers as they tried to escape. Foana's legs bent backwards, tentacles spewed from her mouth. She was, she was smiling so wide I thought her face would crack. I think the Olaf replica was the most disturbing. His face was melted. Bits of pixels looked like human flesh and a wide maw stretched out across what, where his eyes should be. Instead, it was... It was endless rows of teeth, like the kind that you would see, see a shark having. And they kept grinding and meshing together the way the gears do. And it seemed like he could come right out of the television. Aubrey was still dancing, twirling her body around mindlessly as her feet dragged onto the carpet and began to rub a strange pattern into the floor. It looked like she'd actually sprained, maybe even a broken a bone. My wife pushed herself up, desperate to smash the TV to bits, turn off that, that demonic programming, but it was too late. Just as she slammed the device into the floor and the screen cracked, Aubrey became deathly quiet. On the carpet around her was... It was burned what looked to be like some kind of sigil. And then she opened her mouth and spewed out what sounded like... Pure hate. Beasts of the gate. Excrement of demons. Awakening fury, blood in the sky. One true death, it beckons, it comes. A moment later, she collapsed as her eyes rolled back into her head and her mouth foamed, and I, I grabbed her on the way down. It lasted two minutes, longer than any seizure I had ever witnessed, and I worried about brain damage. Then at last, she blinked in confusion as though she had come out of a trance, looking towards me and my wife. Mom? Dad? Why are we up? Is, is the house on fire? Her eyes darted to the smashed flat screen, and then... And they got wider. Did we get robbed? I looked at my wife and realized she had no recollection of the experience. It was... It was blank. It's fine, sweetie. Let's go to bed. She insisted and helped her to her feet. I was sure now that the worst was over. She... She shook and she shivered involuntarily as... She went to her room. Then her body got stiff as I held her. She refused to enter. What is it? My wife asked her. There's someone in my room, Aubrey whispered. I stepped into the dark. My breathing. I held mine as I flicked on the lights and I stared at the slumbering form of the little girl. It was Aubrey. When my daughter was five, we used to play this game of imaginary friends using action figures of Buzz Lightyear and Sheriff Woody from Toy Story. 
Afternoons spent chasing robbers that wore spacesuits and taking down Emperor Zerg over and over again. One time, though, she wanted to play a different game of pretend. Can you be me? She asked me in her Lilo and Stitch pillow fort one cold December night. Well, then who will you be? I asked. She thought about it long and hard for a six-year-old. I'll be me too, she decided finally. Standing there in the room, staring at an exact duplicate of my baby girl, I couldn't help but think back to that time. My Aubrey's always had an active imagination, but this wasn't make-believe. The girl sitting on the edge of her Moana bedsheets was flesh and blood. This was no game, and I knew that the stakes had been raised thanks to a dangerous and dark streaming service that mimicked Disney. What's your name? My wife asked. She got down on eye level with the child. Mom, it's me, it's Aubrey, she replied. The other girl gripped my hand tighter. She's lying! I'm Aubrey! Who is that? Jen? Jen, we have to do something, I told her anxiously. After the bizarreness in the den, I just wanted this nightmare to end. My mouth was dry and I felt helpless. Motherly intuition couldn't help here. We should call the police, Jen decided. No! Both girls shouted that. It was almost in unison. It made me very uncomfortable realizing that they were so much alike. What if... What if they were the same? What if that strange ritual brought a faux Aubrey to this world, and why? Why were they so adamant about not involving other? What was this? Was this because of that stupid streaming service? It felt... It felt very strange to imagine the things that we had seen that night, but... But I had to accept that we didn't have an answer for this sort of... Magic. And that it really did happen. Call Mel. Tell her it's urgent, I decided. Melody is a family friend, a nurse that works swing shift at a nursing home not too far away from our house. I wasn't quite ready to accept the weirdness that had invaded our home, and I figured that if anyone could understand it, or at least help us determine which Aubrey was which, I mean, there, there had to be a difference. Jen went downstairs to call as I guided the girls back to the den. I wasn't sure which one of them was my daughter. Back at that moment, it didn't matter. It seemed like whoever was the fake was doing a, a real good job at hiding it, so, so I took advantage of it. I asked them both to help clean up the mess. What caused all this? One of them asked, as they set the flat screen aside with my help. There were shards of broken glass everywhere, and for a short second, one of the pieces touched the soles of their feet. I expected a response. Aubrey was, was still a bit of a baby when it came to pain, but this didn't seem to faze her in the slightest. And then when she saw my reaction... She winced and acted hurt. I made a mental note to watch that one closely as we started to sweep up the other shards. I wasn't sure if it was a good idea to mention the events that led to the TV's destruction, so I simply kept them busy with chores. In the busy work, I was having a hard time remembering which Aubrey had reacted differently, and I cursed myself slightly for being so tired. The girls seemed not to mind doing the task, though, and once they were done, and Jen told me Mel would be there in about an hour, I... I used that time to get them both a glass of milk and grab tablets to keep them awake until, until she arrived. I didn't want them out of my sight either. They sat on the love seat opposite where the TV had been, and turned on their devices simultaneously as I paced the kitchen. Has either of them done anything, you know, weird? Jen asked. One of them. Uh, they're adverse to pain, I think. I admitted as I took a sip of a bottle of water. Which one? She whispered. Uh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Things, things have happened so fast. Damn it, David! She fussed. I'm sorry. I just, it, it, it's just. What in the devil is happening to us? What, what is that Disney minus anyway? I whispered back. She calmed down and let out a loud, audible sigh, then pulled out her smartphone. And admitted, I've tried to, to shoot a few texts to different coworkers, but everyone's asleep. As far as I can tell. Online, anyway, Disney Minus doesn't exist. Wouldn't it be fun? If things that were fake were real? A voice chimed. Both of us turned to see one of the Aubreys standing there. And I smiled nervously at her. This isn't really the time for games, I chided her, showing her back to the den, but her words stuck with me. What did she mean? 
The doorbell rang and it made me want to jump out of my skin. Too much tension for one night. Mel came in and let out a long sigh. God, David, you would not believe what this old fart did to me today. I swear, this better be real good news, she said as she dropped her purse and went towards the cabinet where we kept the wine. Uh, well, uh, not exactly, my wife admitted as she gestured towards the girls. She just finished pouring a glass of vodka and nearly jolted as she saw them. What in that language? I said instinctively. Mel down her glass of wine quickly and went over to the girls, examining them with keen interest. Sorry, I, it's just, I didn't know you guys had been holding on to me all these years. You know, I always wanted a girl, she said dryly, trying to make light of the situation. Neither of us had the energy to laugh. Is this for real? She muttered as she checked their fingerprints. Of course, they were identical too, or at least it appeared that way from the naked eye. Are you for real? Are you for real? The Aubrey she was examining asked back. How did this happen? Mel asked. We just need to be sure they're both okay and just just know which one of them is our Aubrey. We can sort the rest out in the morning, Jen said. Mel shrugged, perhaps too tired to dig deeper, and went to her car to get a first aid kit. When she returned, she gestured for one of the girls to sit by her. You can bring your iPad, she told her. The Aubrey hopped over to her, snuggled close as Mel started to check vitals. I tiptoed over to the counter, my eyes on the other Aubrey. What happens if this doesn't work and we can't tell the difference? I whispered. Well, think of something, Jen responded. Mel and Aubrey one were chatting excitedly, the girl showing the nurse something on her tablet. There was this soft slightly off orchestra music that caught my attention. I saw a flicker of a familiar looking bird across the screen of the girl's tablet and took a closer step. It resembled the endangered species from Up, except, except all the colors were inverted. They hadn't started watching it yet, so I had a chance to read the description. Down, after removing his son from the womb of the vessel, an ailing father goes on a journey to revive the sky. What the? We probably shouldn't watch anymore. Don't want to distract Mel, I said with an anxious laugh. My friend swatted my hand away. Don't be a helicopter parent, David. The movie began similarly. Awkward boy meets adventurous girl, but it didn't stay the same for long. The Carl character wasn't shy, but extremely stalkerish towards Ellie, excessive over keeping her. When she rejected him, he killed her. And then... Then he inflated her like a balloon to keep her preserved. It was mortifying to watch, but impossible to look away. Let's take that away, and I began, but this time Mel was more insistent. We need to finish the release, she said in a monotone voice. I looked at Jen, unsure of what to do. Was this affecting Melody now? The foe Carl took his bride to be and tied her to the house on the porch, watching as the stretched skin of Ellie was sucked into a vacuum. And then, out of nowhere, the cartoon old man whipped his you-know-what out, and I instinctively grabbed the tablet away. And when I did, I saw that Mel's eyes had turned... white. Believe the oblivion. Return its birth. Return glory. Honor the dead, she said, rising up. She didn't resemble my friend anymore. Instead, her skin looked computerized like the Ellie on screen Mel snap out of this I said anxiously she opened her mouth and chuckled a wide oh strange metallic spider crawled out it was that that strange toy from the first Toy Story movie the the baby with a spindery legs its lifeless eyes looked towards me as it crawled down her body and started towards me <laughs> then then Jen reacted grabbing a knife and slamming it against Mel's fist she shrieked it didn't sound human, but just, just to confirm it, her, her entire head swirled towards her like a, like a moldable clay. A strange stream of strange substances stretched out from her widening mouth towards her. Suddenly, both Aubrey's were on their feet, their eyes showing more, more glitched films. And one was a deranged version of Thor. And the, the ripple in space and time sped across my daughter's pupils as her own skin seemed to peel back. Neither of these girls were mine. Neither were human. From amidst their skin, more strange miniature horrors crawled out. Dark dwarves crackled and screeched towards us. Jen grabbed a fire extinguisher from under the sink, and without hesitation, she began to douse them 
just to confuse the trio as I, as I reached for that knife. I slammed it into Mel's skull once, twice, until she was lying still on the floor. Her body twitched and the girls swarmed me. They, they had attacked me and on the ground I could hear the most demented version of that, that Mickey Mouse clubhouse begin to play. You know, the, the, the hot dog dance, thinking about that, uh, that was just a demonic version of it. They were trying to open my mouth, make the dwarves crawl in, and I thought for sure I was going to die. I was going to die listening to that insane music. And then Jen came in. Jen came in with that old hunting rifle and I immediately, I instinctively told her to stop. One of these was our Aubrey. And then I realized, I realized it couldn't be. Not the way they were acting. This was a threat and we needed, we needed to stop it. She let a bullet smash through both of them. Both died instantly and fell on top of Mel's body and the music slowed to a halt shortly after and I, I stumbled over to my, to my wife. Even though these weren't Aubrey, it was still difficult seeing even a mimic like this. That went well, she said, sarcastically, as she wiped sweat from her brow. She wasn't, she wasn't trying to make light of our nightmare, but I hadn't the faintest idea how we'd possibly explain three dead bodies to anyone, anyone who came asking or, or heard that noise, and worst of all, we were no closer to finding our Aubrey. We stood very still in the room trying to figure out where, and then we heard the faintest cry for help. She stood very still in the room, trying to figure out where it had come from, and then at last we found the source, the tablet. Jen picked it up slowly, her face pale and trembling. I went to see what the problem was, and I found myself at a loss for words. There, there on the screen was what appeared to be a scene straight from Guardians of the Galaxy. And pounding on the glass, trying to escape the electronic device. Our daughter. My wife and I have run out of options quickly due to the supernatural Disney craziness that hit us in just a short few hours. Our best friend is dead. Our daughter is missing in some kind of I don't know, alternate dimension. There was one thing that immediately made sense, though. We needed to find out where my dad had found this bizarre streaming service in the first place. The only good fortune was that his house is only about 15 minutes away, even with traffic. So after we made sure that the tablet that Aubrey was trapped inside of was charging properly via the cigarette lighter, we made our way over. What if he's asleep? What if he's asleep? I muttered. It was nearly three in the morning. The neighborhood was as black as the dark eyes in that Disney program. It was impossible not to think of what those programs were. I mean, the, they were infecting... They were infecting my brain, too. What if we were going to wind up like Mel somehow? Would there... Would there be a way that we could stop it? Another worrisome thought slipped through my exhausted brain as we parked, and I grabbed a hold of Jen's hand. What if my dad isn't my dad, I asked. That gave us both pause. You know what? You might be right. After all, there's nothing I could find anywhere, even using a, a Tor router. Is Disney stuff that he got for Aubrey? It just doesn't exist here. Not, not the here that we're familiar with, she admitted. We need to be careful, I said checking on Aubrey inside the iPad. We had managed to figure out a way to keep her safe in a, in a tranquil part of the movie. It reminded me of the field where Thanos had gone to to rest after the... You know, never mind, I don't want to spoil the actual good movie. Anyway, we put the scene on loop so that she wouldn't be in danger until we sorted this all out. And my dad, or whoever was in here, was our only hope. I stilled my nerves knowing I'd do anything, knowing I would do whatever was necessary to save my daughter. Jen wrapped her fist against the door as loudly as she could. Finally, he opened the door, looking every bit as exhausted as us. David? What in blazes? Is everything okay? He asked. 
Can we come in? I asked. He nodded, switched on the lights in the kitchen, as I hurried to plug in the iPad. Didn't want to risk Aubrey losing battery at any time. The hell is this all about? Where, where's my granddaughter? My dad asked. Dad, maybe, maybe you should take a seat, I advised. I'm fine standing. Now, the looks on your faces are telling me something's happened. Tell me, I said sternly. Well, we were hoping that you could tell us, I said, passing him the tablet to get a glance at our girl trapped in the machine. Dad's eyes widened, and he muttered, Mother of God, how did, how did this happen? You tell us, Dad. Where did you find the Disney Minus service? I asked, keeping my eyes straight towards my dad's responses. I didn't want things to get dicey, but it was clear that there was more tension immediately. I know it sounds paranoid, but after what happened with Mel and Aubrey, I didn't want more to go wrong, and yet that I knew that it would. You wouldn't believe it, even if I told you, Dad said, passing the tablet back. Try us, Jen said. She squeezed my arm. Please, please let him talk, I insisted. Dad tilted his head and muttered, You watched it then? Both of you? I've seen snippets, I said with a shrug. I've looked at it. I don't understand it, Jen answered, as my dad nodded and walked toward his fireplace looked like he wanted to stir a few embers into the flames. Instead, a moment later, he was waving a gun towards us. Holy shit! I screamed. The iPad glitched and this bizarre Captain America wannabe came on screen in a gym chair. So, you want to kill somebody? What do you do? David, come towards me! My dad said as he cocked his gun. First thing you do, overpower the enemy. Cap was saying, as I waved for my wife to get behind me. You were right, David. He's a fake, she said. Make them trust you, Cap said a bit louder as Dad muttered, Please, David, don't listen to her. This thing is not your wife. If, if she's watched those, those cursed images, then she's already infected. His words confused me even more. In infected? Infected with what? Don't, David. He's playing with you. He knows something, Jen warned. I can't explain it. I'm sure before you came here, Jen was her normal self. But now, now that, that faux Disney's taking control of her, her her with the other one from that world, James said. Like, like what happened to Mel, I realized. She had arrived perfectly normal, yet somehow that show had changed her. Was I, was I lucky to have just glanced at it? The only one thing to do in this situation, get them down and out before they could even get close. Fake Cap was proclaiming as I took a tentative step towards my dad. I wanted to be safe rather than sorry. And then Jen snatched me and clenched her hand hard. I thought that it would break. Jen, I said with a short breath as I turned to see my wife's eyes. Quickly becoming as dark as the black cauldron. There's nothing you can do to stop this, she said in a monotone voice. Her skin rippled and altered. And just then, as the transition was finishing... My dad filled her with lead. I screamed as my thick wife tried to attack me and pull me down. Her body continued to folicate and shift as dad desperately tried to kill her. And finally, finally she was still a, a puddle of dark goo slipping out from the bullet-riddled body as I slumped over towards my dad. God. God, what, what is this all about? I could hardly breathe. I, I'd seen too much death in such a short period of time. Bring the iPad over here. I'll, I'll do my best to explain, Dad said in a neutral tone. I, I was too rattled to argue. I snatched it up. I, he cleared off his mantle and arranged the tablet where it was positioned, like a T. It was meant to be uh, some kind of projector. I was about to tell him I didn't have the capability when he pressed a few mysterious keys and a, an image shone into the bare wall. I couldn't even act surprised anymore. Another amazing trick from the strange universe that my father seemed... All too familiar with. I found myself watching what appeared to be a pseudo Marvel Shield video and a faux Nick Fury that looked like he was being played by Clint Eastwood. If you're watching this, then you've already been introduced to the plague that's spreading across our galaxy. We call it a virus because of what it does to anyone who has succumbed to it. Fury proclaimed as images of other false programs flashed on the screen. 
I saw a poorly faked Peter Parker slowly being transformed into an eight-legged freak, his body bursting with egg sacs as they devoured him whole. I saw a disfigured Iron Man becoming melded to a cybernetic slave, going out and killing innocents in the street. I saw an army of flesh-eating three-eyed yellow aliens swarming the galaxy aimlessly infecting anything in their path. Strangers from the outside. The virus, we believe, stemmed from the center of our known galaxy in a large space station, Nick continued, as a diagram of what looked like an upside-down diamond, shaped like a Death Star, appeared. Of course there was a Death Star, I thought to myself. It's your job to find a way to purge this virus before it destroys us all, Fury proclaimed. As the images dissolved, Dad sighed, slowly, and remarked, My allies and I search for ages to locate a gateway to your world. Be free from this madness. He figured, coming here would be safe. Wait, you mean I, you're not? I said, grasping for words. Your father's safe, David. I didn't do any harm to him. Matter of fact, our meeting has helped me to discover a possible cure for this horrific incident. A cure? How? is isn't much time to explain. Wait, okay. But what about Jen? Or Mel? Are they... Are they in this make-believe world that you come from? I don't know. The virus works in a subatomic level. One of our top researchers, Kim, found a way to reduce molecules, keep people safe. Moves between dimensions the way that you would imagine a radio frequency might. Why? Wait, why would you do all this? I muttered. As he returned the image to the show of Aubrey. Thanks to all of the interference, she was now in what appeared to be nowhere from the first Guardians movie. Trapped as a part of the collection. Our galaxy's dying. Our reality is being stripped apart. We need a new home, he told me. So you're invading, he realized. Some of us intend to, uh, but I, I've i noticed ever since that I managed to find the cure. My own mental capacity has improved. I felt free from the virus, he explained. Even so, my daughter, uh, no, my family, is in danger, and it's your fault. You have to help me to get away from here, I told him anxiously. I can try. I believe there exists another version of Frank in this world, and if so, quite likely he'd have a, a way to cross dimensions. He better. Call him, I told him, passing my smartphone. Dad sighed and did as he was told. As I looked back at the bloody mess on the floor, it still looked like Jen was moving. Or that... Something was growing out of her. A few moments later, I realized I wasn't seeing things. Dark, twisting vines were snagging out of the carpet, rooting themselves into the ground as some kind of creature moved towards me. I stumbled backwards and you know, I grabbed the gun, trying to shoot it, but the creature seemed to grow back, despite every attempt that I'd made. You will be... It screamed as its mouth opened wide to spread out more dark vines. I snagged the fireplace poker. I tossed the coals toward the creature, watching as it burned and writhed in the fury. Dad and I watched silently as this new manifestation of evil finally fell to the wayside. Then he muttered, Best to burn his whole body. You know, just to be safe. He's, it felt wrong felt wrong to treat Jen this way. But I knew that I couldn't risk the infection myself or, or another attack. I dragged her now headless body over to the fireplace and I started taking coals and embers to do the job. A few silent moments later and the body was aflame. I was quiet. Trying not to shake. The version of my father from the other dimension returned a short moment later and remarked, Good news, I found her. Good news, I found him. We can meet in half an hour at the old church. I nodded as I watched the strange creature shrivel and die. We didn't have a moment to waste. To face fear is supposedly the destiny of a Jedi, or so all the new Star Wars trailers keep telling me. But I'm no lightsaber-wielding hero, I am a man on the edge of my mental health trying to save my daughter and my wife from what I can only describe as pure hell. 
working alongside a version of my father from a false reality that's created by Disney knockoffs. I've come a long way to succeeding. I've learned there's dangers to make believe that I never knew existed. After leaving the lifeless body of a fake version of Jennifer at my dad's house, we drove in silence for a while. Didn't exactly know what to discuss with this man, who was not even from my reality. There were many questions, but none of them seemed relevant at the moment. I just wanted to save Aubrey. Hopefully in the process. Mel and Jennifer, too. Understand that this whole pseudoscience goes well beyond my graduate school, so... So when we arrived at Frank's house on the outskirts of town, all I could find myself able to do was take short notes. Hopefully, everyone else can make sense of them if they want. Now, Frank claimed that the alternate dimensions were stemmed from the collective consciousness of people from this reality, from our Earth. He also provided me with a tablet with limited range of communications from the journey ahead. He used the example of the Lion King to prove his point. Maybe to dumb it down for me, I'm not sure which, but I did my best to listen. The circle of life is just one clue that Disney places in their films, albeit a very strong one. Do you remember when Mufasa explains to Simba that everything is connected? This is true in between dimensions. Everything that we consider to be fake here, or part of make-believe, is, in fact, the trapped spirits of something extremely real, extremely evil. Do you know what the origins of this belief come from in stories of the African spirit world? While Disney and those who followed him discovered that every single creation of man, great and small, was not a fabrication or a fantasy. He was real, he told us. And he was explaining this as he activated the strange machine that showed a shimmering image of the alternate dimension, so close and yet still so dangerous. During the golden age of Disney, the company must have been trying to protect our world from the chaos this negative dimension could cause, but then, then they got greedy. No. Anyone with eyes can see they're a monopoly now. Dad took a sip from his coffee and remarked, The infection must have managed to spread from our world to yours around the same time the House of Mouse took over those films you refer to as the Star War. We've only known the truth about the evil Imperial force seeking the, to destroy the entire universe. We never, we never could have imagined that here on this side things would be considered fake, Frank added. Only one important question really sprang to my mind. Can it be stopped? I asked. The space fortress that you saw, it seems, to house a very powerful energy force. The Ravagers have tried unsuccessfully to shut it down, but all have failed. It's uh, almost fully operational, though, and the Imperials that have taken over it will likely use it to rip a hole between the dimensions, one big enough for all life forms there to swarm your world, he explained. I shuddered at the implication. That would... That would be an invasion. Then then we need to go, right? We need to go right now, I said. Frank nodded and got all the gear ready, testing the stability of the portal with a few small objects. I think we're ready. I think we are ready. I think we're as ready as we'll ever be, he said. I can only keep the portal open for a short time, so get in and out, Frank also reminded me. Dad passed me his gun and I looked at his pale features before asking, You weren't coming with me? I spent my entire life trying to escape that place, David. It'd be suicide for me to go back now. The Imperial would kill me. If they didn't. And if they didn't do it, they'd at least make me suffer for all eternity, likely trapped in whatever next film they produce, he told me. I could hear the anxiety and the panic in his voice, and I understood. This wasn't his fight. But it's not anymore. I couldn't be angry for that. So I took the weapon, I held my breath, and I stepped headlong into the unknown. It's jarring to even explain what I saw. I find myself in the dark corridors of the second Death Star, at least a very close facsimile of it. Corpses of troopers line the walls, interconnected at different points to gather a hallway of bones and bodies. Some of them seemed alive, I thought, as I stepped into the next room and saw a wide pit covered nearly the entire floor. Twisted, broken bodies of some of my favorite characters form the bottom of the hole in a spider web. Skywalker, Solo, Obi-Wan, Dooku, even uh, distorted Jar Jar was there. They were all there, joined, or rather fused by some unseen force. 
How long had they been trapped there? Carefully, I went around the edge of the pit until I found the next corridor and I took out the tablet that Frank had given me to stay in contact. It was fuzzy and full of interference, but I could still just barely make out a few words. Go. Generator. East. Followed the shadowy path towards the next area, hoping not to be detected. Soon I came along a long chasm and found myself staring at a figure that was crawling across the wall to reach what I assumed was the generator room. It was... me. Although I, I had seen plenty of faux replicas from Disney movies, seeing myself was... Well, it was unsettling more than any other. I found myself transfixed and watching as the other me reached the chamber, and then... And I realized it was possible he was going for the same thing I was. Maybe we could work together? Maybe I could end this nightmare as quickly as it had begun. I raced up the stairs to meet him, only to be met with my first obstacle. Two guards blocked my path, and I instinctively knocked them aside, hearing them angrily scream as their skulls smashed in the stairs. At least stormtroopers aren't any better than grunts in this world either, I thought as I reached the generator. What happened next was almost unbelievable. Even the crazier fanfictions haven't seen this, I thought as I studied the scene. The other me was in a standstill with a faux Vader. His dark, blood-red cape swirled about as his twin sabers swooped towards him, but he held his ground. The villain rasped, and his long tubes that provided him oxygen pushed out what looked like poisonous gas as I nervously aimed my weapon, and this was my only chance. I let out a volley of blaster fire, but the fake Vader was every bit as strong as the ones from the movies that I knew and loved. He froze the bolts mid-flight and laughed, taunting me. Do you honestly think you can stop the inevitable? Soon your world will be another conquest, he growled. And the other me leapt onto his back, trying to pull apart his oxygen tubes. I rushed towards to help. The faux Vader held both of us with unseen magic and tossed us like ragdolls. It was like I had always imagined the Force would be, but probably a hundred times worse. Scenes of the horror that ended Rogue One flashed in my mind as the mimic of Vader ignited his crimson blade. Both of you will pay for this, he cackled. No, we won't, the other me replied, tossing what looked like a hand grenade towards his face. He flinched, not expecting it, and the entire room blew apart. And then we ran for it, towards the generator. He ripped apart the vital circuitry as we passed, and I heard alarms blare across the station. It wouldn't be long until this place would explode. Outside one of the windows, I could see ships arriving to try a suicide pact and destroy this mimic Death Star. How did you get here? The replica me asked in between jogs. Too long to explain. Where's Aubrey? I asked as we turned a corner. He paused, staring at me for a long moment, and then... And then a, a cold realization hit me. Aubrey's dead in this world, isn't she? I asked. I knew the answer, but it, but it still hurt. He nodded slowly, his face a mixture of pain and grief at what I had that he had lost. How many other families were here doing the same thing, I wondered. How much had Disney taken from them? And from behind us, a roar came. I turned to see what looked like a hybrid of a, of a Rancor and the Incredible Hulk chasing after us. It was smashing past all the droids and troopers in its way, ready to rip us limb from limb. We need to get back to your world and, and detonate this gate, my doppelganger told us. I hesitated. I didn't want to leave without my daughter, but the, the monster was telling me at that moment that it was my only option. We zigzagged towards the portal where I had arrived and pushed through as easily as I had come. The others waited for me on the other side and looked at my duplicate anxiously. David, thank God, Dad said, hugging the other me. Somehow he knew how to distinguish us. Hurry, close the gate, I said. But it was already too late. The portal was spreading. The rancor that the Hulk thing was almost through. I clenched my teeth and I realized our battle was not over. There was a chance. There wasn't going to be an after credit scene for the story. This is not the happily ever after I wanted for my family. Not even close. My wife is trapped inside a negative dimension of fake Disney monsters and my daughter, and I have barely survived. I hardly have the energy to finish this story, but I'll do my best. 
Maybe along the way I can help others from ever being overcome by whatever this is. Let's start off where we left off. Alongside an alternate version of myself and my father and a scientist I hardly just met, I was facing an interdimensional threat. A raging green monster was piercing the fabric of our reality and was about to swallow us all whole when Frank waved his hand slowly the same way that I had seen Stephen Strange do so in many Avengers films. A short second later and the portal closed and the hulking beast collapsed in front of us, split in two with dark blood pouring out into the carpet. Its eyes went lifeless a moment later and melted into the fibers. I'd been holding my breath, but finally I let go with a sigh of relief. Still, I wasn't too satisfied that I had lost my chance to save Aubrey, especially since I knew that the other me had started a detonation in that faux Death Star. We have to go back. No, we, ha we have to do something for all those innocent people that are still trapped there, I insisted. I'm sorry, David. It was necessary to stop this madness from spreading across both our worlds, my mimic father told me. I wanted to believe him, but part of me, part of me simply has no energy to do so. For all I know, the three of you planned this from the get-go, simply to, to take over my life and ruin my family, I spat back. I was tired, I was stressed out, I was angry. I didn't know if this was even true, but I needed to lash out towards something, and right at that moment, they were definitely my enemies. What happened next confirmed it. So you're going to help me find another way to save my daughter? You hear me? I responded with a yell. The trio seemed taken aback, and my other self was just... just looking distraught at the idea that I refused to accept. That Aubrey might be gone forever. If there's no reason to have a cow, David, I know what it's like to lose a child, he began. I didn't want to listen, though, because that one simple phrase told me everything I needed to know. So you're all pretending, I said with a dry mouth. My hands were clammy. I wanted to scream again, but somehow I maintained my cool. What? Frank said, blankly staring at me. I raised my blaster towards the mimic me. Show me where Aubrey is. Now, I demanded. The trio held up their hands, defensively at first, and then... Then they all rushed towards me in a flurry of yellow. It was like they were moving at super speeds. My alternate grabbed me and tackled me to the ground, tumbling towards the Rancor corpse. I quickly held the blaster towards his neck without hesitation, and I pulled the trigger. His skull blasted apart, spilling out blood and dark slime onto my face. As I pushed him off of me and pointed my weapon towards the other feral people, their cover blown, my faux father and the scientist looked ready to rip me limb from limb. They reminded me of all those, those Treehouse of Horror episodes that I had been forced to watch as a kid, the ones that made me sick. You don't understand how much we have fought to be free of the curse of this madness. They kept us locked away, trying to protect this world. How, how was that fair? How could we ever be happy to raise children in a dark galaxy like that? My mimic father asked. He was slowly getting closer. I shook my head, tired of all the lies. All they cared about was saving their own hide. Had they, had they ever intended to help me? I took a step back, and I felt the dead creature grapple my leg, preparing to strike, and instinctively I fired another bolt from the blaster. It triggered Frank's equipment to reactivate, and behind me, the portal shimmered and opened again, this time sending a wave of flames towards us as the explosion from that faux Death Star threatened to engulf us all. I dropped to the floor, wincing in pain as the Inferno scorched my back and pushed over towards the two remaining mimics. Both of them shrieked like mindless ghouls as the blaze took apart their bodies, revealing to me a sickly yellow zombie under the false skin they had been wearing. It reminded me of how the Simpsons looked, you know. And they had those parodies of the Pirates of the Caribbean, and they were still actively trying to hurt me, and without any more hesitation, I aimed straight for their heads and fired. The headless corpses didn't stop, though. Something inside them was still treating them like, like puppets. But soon as their bodies were consumed by the explosions, it was over. Nothing remained in the room, save for the gateway itself and the lifeless corpses. And then I knew, I knew what I had to do next. I had to go back. Go back and find Aubrey. I kept my finger on the trigger of the blaster and went inside the portal, maneuvering through the destruction of the fake Death Star. The mimics of all the Disney stars were here, all of them, trying desperately to keep their fortress from collapsing. It almost seemed too easy that we had defeated them. Dad? I heard a voice say from the beyond. Though experiencing the worst pain of my life, 
When I heard that little girl crying out for help, I forgot all else. I looked around the bend and I stumbled. I stumbled toward her and helped her into my arms. Thank goodness, you're okay. I brushed her hair repeatedly, trying to treasure that moment. Behind us, the dangerous creatures from every sort of faux Disney were paying attention to our embrace. I felt almost sorry for them. I knew they were trying to get a better life to, to evade the inevitable. Together, we want. Together, they begged. But I couldn't risk more danger to myself. What of my daughter? I, I moved slowly towards the portal, thinking that I could, I could just escape again. <laughs> You're going nowhere, a robotic voice said. I'm a short, hairless raccoon. He was snarling at me with prosthetic teeth. He stood in front of the portal, and behind him I saw the other ravagers approach. My father said you wanted to be free from the curse of this place, I said, holding Aubrey close to me. I had no idea what they were capable of. We do. Which is why we intended to take everything from your world and lock it here, a foe Minnie Mouse said. Half of her face burnt off and the other half covered in insects. I nearly puked. There's one final thing they didn't tell you. This entire exchange of reality is necessary to maintain balance. Their energy sources exist because of your dimension. We can't survive without one another. Pete's lookalike told me. I knew that he was being sincere, but that didn't make it any less frightening. So the virus has to exist. And Walt Disney trapped it here with this film. Now you want to reverse the process. It won't work, I said. I didn't even believe my own words. The other assembly of Disney hacks laughed like, like it was some kind of hive mind. The stream is our gateway into the hearts and minds of every person in your reality. Eventually, all of them be subdued, the mouse said. It was horrifying to consider what they were going to accomplish. This, this had to end. And I only knew of one way. I used the last of the blaster fire to destroy Hank's tech and rush through the portal that the raccoon had been guarding. Aubrey clutched my arms and held me close, crying softly as we stood there. At last, this nightmare could be finally over. Since the incidents occurred, I haven't heard any references of this, this Disney Minus streaming service anywhere. I've been keeping my ears and my eyes open across the web, though, not only to spread the warnings, but hoping that someone might be able to figure out a way to cross. But this is because of what Aubrey told me about the place where she had been trapped. See, Dad is there. He's on a ship sailing towards the edge of the world. Aunt Mel is too, they need our help, she would tell me repeatedly. In her endless sleep, she would fearfully fight off invisible pirates. And I didn't know much. I knew that nothing could be the same until I rescued, I rescued Jennifer and Mel. I put an end to that dangerous alternative dimension. I got a hit on this post not too long back. From another user who said they'd found the Disney minus on the dark web. And I think this I think this might be the chance I had been waiting for. I'm going to take it. I have to end this once and for all. I've offered a close friend to let Aubrey sleep over so I could go and speak to this stranger and see if they knew about the dangerous shadow world. I know there's a chance I might not make it back. I might not even get to cross over and find my wife or or my best friend. But Aubrey and the other children? Ones tormented by these fake monsters. They need me. I can't back out now. There's no going back from something this big. Disney destroyed my dreams. So this time, I'm returning the favor. Hey there kids and happy holidays, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to tell you guys thank you for watching tonight's video. If you enjoy watching videos here on YouTube, then you should check out 
the Mr. Creepy Pasta Storytime Podcast, which is available on Spotify and on iTunes and on Google Play and everywhere like that. If you enjoy listening to Mr. Creepy Pasta Storytime Podcast, you'll enjoy watching it on YouTube because it's the same show. You guys are both hearing the exact same thing at the exact same time. Also, thank you guys for supporting me on Patreon or on Popbase. You guys who are the top supporters on Patreon, especially, thank you so much. Like Joey Gilbert, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Wayne Milstead, Chaminsky, Ken Lando Higuchi, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Stephen Van Huss, Tristan Pelton, G Weevil 3, Diana Krauss, Asia, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, Nico Kyle, Caleb Dougal, Daniel Paulson, Dante Rao, Last Blade Song, The Ginger Bros, Don Mewmeister, Eliminator 86, Nubsky, Finley E. Hopkins, Steampunk Sinner, Rafael Rodriguez, Optimistic Avocado, and Dr. Strawberry. Everyone there, as well as in the description down below, thank you guys so much. If you'd like to also follow me on Popbase, where you can get a couple of different updates here and there and play games along with me, then you can do so on your phone. It's on Android and on Apple. And if you guys are looking for something like a hot beverage, such as, say, a tea for the cold winter months, then my wife is still selling teas over at etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea, including a Mr. Creepypasta tea that has me on it dabbing. Don't actually, actually, if you do order that tea, request that sticker because we made it, but she didn't want me to put it on the, on the tea. She said it wasn't professional. I think it's the, whatever. Check back throughout the entirety of the holiday season for more horror stories every single day. Forever. Sweet dreams, kids. <laughs>